Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. On September 14th of 2003, at 11.30 p.m., police were called to the home of 3406 Brownsville Road in Pennsylvania. This was the home of Bob Kramer, a politician who served as the Republican County Commissioner from 1996 to 2000. The call was made by Kramer's then 14-year-old son, Charles. It appeared that Bob had had an altercation with his oldest son, 19-year-old Bobby Jr. It was an altercation over a very simple dispute regarding a bathroom. In this altercation, a punch had been thrown, a punch that was of supernatural force, sending the recipient of the punch through the house. Bobby Jr. was taken to Jefferson Memorial Hospital, and Bob Sr. was charged. The arrest was a long time coming, as the momentum of their haunted home had reached a crescendo. Eleven years later, in August of 2014, a book called The Demon of Brownsville Road was published. This book was written by Bob Kramer and documented Bob's own accounts of the paranormal experience in his dream home. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very, very big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to join our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we are out on location and I just got to talk to you guys about this demonic haunting of Brownsville Road. All right, you guys, as you probably know, as I said, I am on location. I was not planning on filming. I don't have any makeup on. I just put a little bit of lip gloss on and some mascara. My hair is dirty. I've literally been going through archives today. I'm sitting in a bedroom with a bunch of suitcases around me right now. I don't even have a place to put my microphone, so I got I to gotta hold my microphone, like Madonna style, like rock star style. That's okay. But I just, I literally just missed you guys, and I, I found this case, and I don't know why I've never heard of this case before, but holy, holy, holy crap. It has been occupying a lot of space in my mind over these last few days. And I just want to talk to you guys about this case. And I, I cannot wait to hear what you guys have to say about this. So, so with that being said, I apologize that my set is not my typical set. I apologize that I am not really camera ready. But nonetheless, this story was just so personal to me that I'll, I'll explain a little bit later why this is personal to me and i just want to get your your opinions i want to hear what you guys have to say about about this case um again i i had i just found out about this case and i'm i'm cannot believe that i have gone now 41 years thank you guys for all the birthday wishes 41 years of my life 
not knowing about this story. But now I do know about this story. So let's talk about it. So we were traveling. And as we were traveling, I was listening to a podcast. And this podcast talked about this story and actually interviewed Bob Sr. and Bob Jr., who were two, well, we'll say really the main recipients of this paranormal phenomenon that was happening in their home. Now, again, this was very personal to me. And if you guys have been on my channel for a while, you know that I am a ghost magnet. Like, I don't have any choice. Like, sometimes I laugh at people who are ghost hunters because they're like, oh my God, I heard, I heard walking down the hallway and I got scared. I'm like, when you are a ghost magnet, you don't have a choice but to cowgirl up. You don't have a choice but to deal with this. And in this situation, with Bob Jr., especially with Bob Jr., who I think, think is probably around my age and his father Bob Sr. I felt just so much empathy especially for Bob Jr. because this haunting in this house even though the whole family was affected by it from my perspective as somebody who doesn't know this family it's never been to this house just from what I understood listening to this story Bob Jr. definitely was the target of this um this haunting and I, I firmly believe as somebody myself who my whole life has been targets of hauntings and targets of paranormal activity, I do believe, in my opinion, that certain people are just magnets for entities on the other side of the bell, uh, veil, whether that be earthbound spirits like ghosts or actual demons. Um, I, again, I'm one of these people and it's not something that you really know how, no one really teaches you how to control this. Um, I have my speculations as to why that is, but I'm not hundred percent sure because you can have the same people living in the same haunted house or, or in the same haunted area and they have no experiences. I mean, that was my, that was me growing up. I grew up in a, a very demonically haunted house and I was the only one in my family that experienced that. I never, my sister never talked about experiencing anything. She never had scratch marks on her or bruises on her. Neither did my parents. Although my parents witnessed me getting beaten up by spirits, they witnessed me, that happening to me, it never happened to them. And so I do believe that there are certain people, whether it's the blood, the blood type, I don't know, um, whether you're maybe a wanderer or maybe it's, it's people that just have they just have a different energy that that spirits are attracted to. I I don't know. Or it's karma. Who knows? But I do think, and we're going to talk about this at the end because there's a lot of criticism for this family coming out and talking about this case from people who had lived at the house beforehand, saying that they didn't experience anything. Which we do have evidence that maybe um, contradicts that. I don't know. It's their story. But two things can be true, right? Let's say they didn't experience anything and the Kramer family did. Two things can be true. It could have been that the family living there beforehand just wasn't a magnet for this activity. There could have been activity all around them and they just weren't magnets for it or didn't have the eyes to see it. So they never saw it. Whereas the Kramer family could see it. But anyway, I digress. Let's get into the story, guys. I, I really cannot wait to hear your, your opinion. So, and again, this is not how I normally do it, guys. I normally don't like to look at my notes while doing these shows. I like to give it very professional, but we're not in a professional setting right now. So I apologize for looking down at my notes while talking and addressing you. So Bob Kramer, he was born Robert Wes Wesley Kramer in 1956 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Again, he was a politician. He was sat for the city commission. He also was a veteran, which we're going to talk about. Now he's an author because he's written his book about his experiences in this house. And he is also a businessman. Now, this house, and, and, I, and I apologize if you hear commotion in the background. I'm in a very busy place. You might hear some other people talking in the background. That's not ghost guys. That's actual living people that are also in this area with me right now. So I apologize if that hopefully it won't come through because I'm mic'd. So hopefully you're just hearing my voice. But if you do hear whisperings in the background, it's other people. All right. So let's talk about this. So this house, 3406, is located in an area, area called Brentwood, Pennsylvania. Brentwood, Pennsylvania is just south of, of Pittsburgh. It's considered like a borough of Pittsburgh, from my understanding, although it is seen as... I'm filming. Oh. 
I told you guys this was not, not very professional. Here's Robbie. Here's Robbie. All right, low key, Robbie is going to be joining us for the rest of this. Sorry, guys, this is not very professional. But anyway, I digress. Where were we? Brentwood, Pennsylvania. It is just south of Pittsburgh. It does seem to be like technically its own town, a small town, but literally could also be considered like a suburb of Pittsburgh. Um, very, it seems to be a pretty town, but this house is located there. And this house is like this very majestic house. It's got a lot of majesty to it. It's a three-story house. And Bob Kramer, the father talks about in this podcast how when he was a little boy he, he says around the age of seven he started to have this almost magnetism towards this house like he, this house really captivated him right he would walk past it he would he would watch it he said it just was so alluring it was so old it was built around the turn of the 20th century early 1900s it was three stories of a house that was designed with like a servant's quarter back in a time in history that is not really you the culture is not the culture we have now. Now, Bob, I will have to correct Bob on one thing. And we're going to look at the house in a little bit, you guys. Don't worry. But Bob, in this podcast, said that he envisioned it as being almost like a Southern-style house, like a Southern-style, I'm assuming he meant plantation. Bob Kramer, that is not what a Southern plantation looks like. It is a beautiful house. I'll, I'll give you that. It's a very beautiful house, but that is not what a Southern plantation looks like. That house, in my opinion, is a very northern, very Yankee house. So maybe, Bob, come come travel down south before you start saying that, because that is not, friend, that is not what, what a southern house looks like. But anyway, so Bob kind of had this fascination with this house uh, during his adolescence, his, his childhood. And I wrote in my notes, um, quote unquote, spell casting, like Rome, Rome, Georgia. I've talked about this, you guys. I, I believe in my opinion, and, and, and I have reasons for this belief for stuff that I've been told off camera by people who know what they're doing, that Rome, Georgia, that I have issues with, is very satanic. And then there's uh, allegedly a lot of black magic happening and people get like transfixed on Rome. It's happened to my family. I feel like I'm a kind of a lone wolf. Like I don't, you know, I, I, I love my mom, but I, I have to keep it a boundary up because she has decided to like, like a flame to the moth to move back to that town, even though that town is a very dangerous town, in my opinion. And it's, it, people get very, in that town, they get glazed looks in their eyes. Like, they can't, it's like, well, Georgia is the best town in the whole wide world. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Robbie, no, no, no. Sorry, you guys, you might hear him <laughs> looking himself. Um, it's not. But I get that when Bob Kramer is mesmerized by this house, it's like this spell casting, this, this, and this is just my perception, guys. This is just my opinion, not fact. My opinion is like spell casting, like, like, it's like a Venus fly trap, like entraps people in their energy. Just like I believe my family got entrapped by Rome, Georgia, where we have no lineage there. Why the hell do they still live there? We have no lineage there. But they go back because they're entrapped by it. And those that of, of us that can see it, see it for what it is and don't want anything to do with it. Right. So anyway, I digress. So so Bob ends up like graduating from college. He ends up going to serve in the army. He signs up to be a part of the military. He ends up in Kentucky. He has a very, very, very successful military career. Thank you, Mr. Kramer, for your service to our country. Anyway, so about 10 years into his military career, his family experiences a tragedy. I believe his brother, his older brother, was killed in a, an accident. I think that's what happened. But anyway, Bob decides at this point it's important for him to move his, back to Brentwood so that he can be a support system for his parents. Totally understandable. Totally, totally understandable. This is now 1988. So Bob and his wife, Lessa or Lisa Ellie -L -E -S -A, I'm, I apologize if I'm saying you know, I want to say it's a way of saying Lisa but it, it, it's kind of spelled Lessa so I, I, I apologize Lisa or Lessa if I'm saying your name beautiful name beautiful spelling wrong um but his wife and they have four children at this four young children at this time and they decide now we're going to move back to Brentwood to help support Bob's family well lo and behold plot twist they move back and this 
house that Bob has been infatuated with his whole life is on the market. It's available. So Bob was like, ho-hum, let's go take a tour. It sounds like uh, from his retelling of the story that when they take the tour, he's really more interested out of curiosity just to see what the house looks like on the inside. Like his whole life, he's had this fantasy about this house. So he just wants to see what it looks like on the inside. And of course, it did not disappoint. He walked into these old these old houses. You know, they have like 10 feet tall, tall ceilings. They have these grand staircases, beautiful woodwork, servants' quarters, massive kitchens. They just don't make houses like they used to. As my mama would say, it's a fine home. It's a fine home. They don't make houses nowadays like that. And so he's just mesmerized by this childhood fantasy of what does his house look like. He does bring with them his wife, of course, his wife, and two of his older, ch according to him, his older children. So his daughter, who was four, and Bobby Jr., the other target as we'll get into in this story who is three at the time so that means the other two were just babies right so the oldest one is four the daughter is four he's okay buddy sorry guys it's almost dinner time so he's getting a little anxious to get his food you, you dog owners will uh dog parents will absolutely understand that but anyway so they walk into this house and from what i understand it, it sounds like the person showing the house was the current owner I could be wrong about that, but I've listened to this podcast now a couple of times as well as done a lot of research on my own, and it does sound like that, so I apologize if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the person showing the house possibly was the wife of the couple who currently owned it. Now, Bob's wife, Lessa or Lisa, we don't hear too much about her throughout this story, but I like her. I like her. I like this girl. She immediately, according to Bob, immediately when they got to the house was like, no, that's a big no. She was creeped out. She did not like the way she felt in the house. She thought the couple showing the house was weird and she didn't want anything to do with it. But nonetheless, they're, they're given the tour. They get down to the basement area and they notice that their three-year-old Bobby Jr. is no longer with them. All of a sudden, they hear this scream come out of their child, their little boy. They go to find Bobby Jr., who is now on the landing going towards the second floor. The woman giving them the tour, how creepy is this, my friends, goes up to Bobby and goes, Honey, are you okay? Did you see something? At that point, I would have been like, You were done. We're done. No more tour. If I was the wife, Lisa Lessa, who was like, this is creepy. If I had heard my three-year-old son screaming and then the current owner's like, honey, did you see something? I would have been like, Bob, honey, if you want this house, you're going to be living here alone. We aren't do we're not doing this. We're not messing with this. But nonetheless, they persisted. This is a different time, too, guys. This is 1988. So, you know, man of the house, Bob makes the decision. They, they, they give an offer to the current owners, and they take it on the first offer, which is weird. You guys, I, I mean, I've never bought a house, but I know how this goes. Usually when you there's like a bidding war going on, and you're, you're trying to negotiate uh, a price with the current owners, and they took it on the first offer. So that's strange. That should have been a red flag. And so, but for Bob, he's like, oh, lucky me. It's my lucky day. I get to live in this house. I fantasized about as a child. On December 12th, 1988, the family packs up. They move into this house that is going to be their forever home, the house of Bob's dreams, yada, yada, yada. So immediately upon moving into the house, they do start having some issues, like immediately. But it's not, at first, it's not harmful or, or violent. It's just, there was a hall closet, um, which is going to come back into the story at the end of the story, that Bob would go into. And it's like, a, it was one of those light, the pull lights. And every time he would go to get the, the string the, to pull the light on, it he couldn't get it because it would be like wrapped around the light bulb, right? So that was weird. That was weird. But nonetheless, whatever. They start to hear like knockings. They start to, you know, they, they go upstairs to go to bed at night. They come down in the morning and all the lights would be turned on. Um, they would hear faucets. Like they would leave leave an area and then they'd come back on. The faucet would be on full blast. And that has happened to me many times. Our yoga shala is haunted by a good spirit. And many times I've gone to the yoga shala and like all three of the sinks within that business are turned on full blast. So that is apparently something that spirits like to do. But it doesn't necessarily mean anything to fair. 
nefarious, right? It, it could just be that there's a ghost. Things like doors would open and close on their own. Um, Bobby Jr. in the interview says that was kind of freaky. Like you're sitting there in the room playing with your toys and all of a sudden the door opens and then closes on its own. That that could freak anybody out, right? Banging on the door um, in the basement. Apparently, Bob Sr. had set up like a little workstation, a little little man cave before there were man for bed man caving was a word where he would do some, t some workmanship and, and there was a radio down there and sometimes he'd come on and the radio come down and the radio would be turned on just little things like that like typical stuff you would experience in a haunted house it's not hurting anybody it's not t traumatizing anybody you know just normal stuff and, and bob even said that he accepted that this house was probably haunted a lot of houses are haunted trust me a lot of them are and you just kind of learn to live with it. I mean, that's kind of, I, I've, I've been in a lot of haunted places. And there is a difference between like a haunted house and a demonically possessed house. I've been in both. Haunted houses, you, like, like I said, our, our yoga shala is haunted. I call the ghost Tom. I don't know if that's his name. That's the name I feel like I should call him. And I talk to him. I'm like, dude, being a little too rowdy this morning. I need to calm on down. And he does calm down. He's very interactive. He doesn't want to scare you. So most ghosts, it's really not that big of a deal. Most people can live with it. But then things start to get a little bit creepier to the point where all four of the kids start to get really freaked out. And Bob Sr. does mention that he would wake up in the morning and the kids would be in their bed. I get that. When you're scared, you want to go get in your mom and dad's bed. Totally understandable. So at this point, we're seeing this um, almost like it, it's like a snowball. Like it's just getting more and more and more and more and more and more active. We don't see anything too aggressive yet happening, but it's becoming a bit of an issue. So this is the first time Bob's like, you know what? Let's just call a Catholic priest. And again, guys, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't really trust, trust the Catholic church, nor do I trust any of the other churches, but that's a story for a different day. But he does call a Catholic priest to come in and bless the house. So that happens. Catholic priest comes in first time. We're going to see many blessings of this house as the story goes on. Trust me. So again, you guys, at this point, Bobby Jr., who was three at the purchase of the house, does seem to be and continues to be one of the main targets of the spirit in this house. Once again, this does not shock me. There are people like myself, I feel like Bobby Jr. and I have a lot in common. I would love to talk to him. I think we're about the same age because I really felt for him in this story like my i felt maybe that's why i wanted to do this story because i just i felt so personal to me because i could empathize with what he was going through and um when this priest comes in the first priest comes in he goes through the the, the first floor and he sprays the holy water does the prayers he goes up to the second floor and bobby jr who's again only like three or four at this time runs past the priest and like blocks his room and tells the priest that he could not come into his room and bobby jr explains it like he's making an x across the door like you cannot come in now here's the interesting thing my friends bobby jr does not seem to even like his room in fact bobby jr's room freaks him out so much that he sleeps in the closet for many, many years, like pulls a mattress into the closet, sleeps in the closet with his lights on. I don't blame him. I understand that feeling, Bobby Jr. In fact, I actually feel like I was thinking about this the other day. I feel like I'm the opposite of claustrophobia, of claustrophobic, whatever that is, because I only feel safe in small spaces, like when I'm compact in. And when Bobby Jr. was telling this story about being in the closet sleeping i like that resonated with me i was like of course he was in the closet sleeping on a mattress i would do the same thing and maybe answered a lot of questions for me in my own head about my certain little, little personality traits that i have today about wanting to be kind of compacted and and feeling safe when i'm kind of compacted so with that being said, there was no reason for Bobby Jr. under his own volition to want to stop the priest from coming in his room. Because again, he doesn't even like his room. He's scared of his room. So that's weird. And this is not the first time we're going to see Bobby Jr. and Bob Sr. for that matter being influenced, coerced into taking actions that they normally wouldn't take. Now soon after this, Bobby Jr. would go on to see a figure. He would see a cloaked dark figure 
in his room. And for a long time, Bobby didn't tell anybody that he was seeing this figure. It wasn't until his other brother, another brother, one of the kids, also saw the same figure when they were in the living room watching TV that they realized that this is an actual issue. This dark cloaked figure also started to interact with Bobby Jr. And my friends, well, that sounded real Southern, my friends, my friends, <laughs> When a spirit starts to interact with you, that is a level of fear that I can't even explain. It is one thing to see a spirit. It is another thing to tell a spirit to stop scaring you and it stops. And then it's a whole other thing when that spirit is messing with you. It's like you know it's there, you know it's attacking you, but you have no clue what to do. You have no clue what to do. So I empathize with Bobby Jr. so much. Buddy, buddy, if you see this video, I don't know if you will or not. Listen, I see you. Not, not literally. That, that sounded a bit stalkerish. I don't literally see you. I don't even know what you look like. But I see you from like an emotional, mental perspective. Bro, like down in Georgia, you were up in Pennsylvania. I was down in Georgia around the same time having the exact same experiences. I understand. Like, I, I applaud you for getting through that because that is hell on earth. And I'm going to say something right now because I can already see some of the comments. Do not tell people. If you, are go if, if you know somebody who is going through a paranormal um, haunting, well, let's just call it what it is, paranormal abuse, First of all, they don't want it to be happening to them. It's not their choice to have it happen to them. They want it to stop just as much as the next person. And telling them to say, just tell it to go away in Jesus' name. If you tell somebody that, you obviously have absolutely no clue what spiritual warfare really is, which we're going to get into. That doesn't work, my friends. And how clever of the church to make you think that would work. Because remember, church is the name of a demon. Okay? That does not work. If that worked, we would not be in the state we are in today in 2024 with the world around us. People who say that, people who say, oh, just say in Jesus' name, that is some heavy cognitive dissonance. That is like somebody who has absolutely no no perception of reality. And that is somebody who probably spirits don't even want to mess with because they have no conception of what real spiritual warfare looks like. So if you're one of those people who thinks you know it all when it comes to spiritual warfare, as we say in the South, bless your heart. Have some respect. People who are going through this, have some respect for them. They don't want to be, they're exhausted. They're exhausted. They're in physical pain. They typically have bruises all over them and they don't know what to do. And nobody around them knows what to do. It's like if somebody has a sickness, you wouldn't go to somebody who has a sickness and tell them just like if somebody had cancer, you wouldn't go up to them and be like, oh, just pray in Jesus' name for it to disappear and it will disappear. You wouldn't say that to them, would you? So don't say that to somebody who's going through spiritual warfare. This shit kills people. Okay, have some respect for the battle that person is fighting and be grateful that you're not experiencing it. Just wanted to get that out of the way. If anybody says anything about that in the comment section, I'm actually going to delete that comment because as, as far as like that's what you say to get rid of spirits, because I consider that comment to be abusive because it's not what you say. You would again, again, think about it that way. If you knew somebody who had cancer, you wouldn't go to that person and say, you know what? If you just pray in Jesus's name, the cancer will go away. You would never say that to that person because you know that's not going to happen. So don't say that to somebody who's being abused by the paranormal. Don't do it. It's rude, it's evil, it's arrogant, it's narcissistic, don't do it. And if anybody puts on the comment section, I see that as abuse, I'm taking it down, okay? All right, anyway, and besides, the name Jesus means hell Satan. If you're new to this, this channel, you should really look that up. That's what his name means. His real name was Yeshua, so let's, go, let's try to go back to his real name. Anyway, so... Think the, the ante is being upped, right? Now they're actually seeing this, this figure that's interacting with them in the house. 
Bobby Jr. talks about being pulled off his bed by his feet. In one night, he explains his blanket being pulled off of him and then, like, folded neatly at the foot of his bed. This stuff is scary. Like, this is scary stuff. I've experienced this stuff. This is really, really scary stuff. And, again, my heart goes out to Bobby Jr. I hope that he's gotten therapy and gone through the healing he needs to go through because I have a feeling, Bobby Jr., if you're watching this, this probably wasn't the last time you experienced paranormal phenomenon. You're probably very, very sensitive to this phenomenon now, even now. So I, I bet you've dealt with this many times before. And I really hope that you've learned, as I have learned, you learned how to deal with this gift you have. I don't want to really call it a gift. Whatever it is about us that attracts spirits, I, I hope that you've figured it out. Because if not, shoot me an email at esotericatlanta gmail.com and I will talk you through some stuff, buddy. But anyway, so let's let's keep going with this story. I, I digress, so let's keep going. All right, so now here's something that I, I have to say. This next part of the story, if I if this if I had been Bob Senior, I would have demanded more answers. But I guess you just never know what you're going to do in this situation. But what had happened was Bob Sr., the father, was outside doing yard work, as anybody would do in their own yard. And he decides that he's going to plant some flowers. And so he starts digging and he, he's putting his shovel in the ground and boom, he hits a box. He pulls this box up and inside this box are a bunch of Catholic trinkets. He decides, as any logical person would, to call the previous owner. So he calls the previous owner, and the previous owner informs him to put the box back, don't touch it, and don't ask any more questions. I would have been like, no. You sold me this house with this box of buried Catholic trinkets, I think I deserve to know why. Why? But according to Bob Sr., at that point, he just goes, okay, and he reburies the box. Now, at this point, Bob is also building in his political career, Bob Sr. So a lot of what's happening to them and the, to the family inside the house is definitely kept quiet. All right, sorry guys about that break in the filming. My Grubhub delivery got here two hours late and I was starving, so I slammed down a veggie sandwich real quick before I came back because I, got, I got to keep talking to you guys. I just, I just, I just got to keep telling you guys this story. So as we left off before I cut the foot of the filming was they're experiencing all this stuff in the house, right? Bob found the weird box outside. Bob Sr. found the weird box outside. Bob Jr. is seems to be the target for most of the paranormal activity, although all the kids are seeing things and are getting a little scared in the house, ending up in the bed with their parents at night. Um, Bob has already called in one priest one time to do a blessing of the house where Bob Jr. was like, you ain't going in my room, when Bob Jr. was already afraid of his room and sleeping in his closet. But at the same time, as all of this is going on, Bob Sr. is building in his political career. And I think nowadays it would be a different story, right? Where we would be, be more open about talking about these things. But this was, you know, the 90s, early to coming into the, you know, early 2000s. And you just didn't talk about this stuff. People thought you were crazy, right? People thought you were literally crazy. And so they kept everything very, very hush hush which I'm sure probably added extra tension to the family. The wife, the one I adore, I really want to hear from this wife. I don't think they're married anymore, but I really want to hear her side of the story because she was, from the, from the get-go, she was like, this place is creepy. From the get-go, as, as our friend Tamara always says, listen to your gut. From the get-go, her gut was like, no, no. And now she's stuck living there watching her children go through terror. Um, as Bobby Jr. said, they were all having nightmares, like intense nightmares. Bobby Jr. is being just targeted by this, this, this thing that no one can see. The dog, I forgot to even talk about the dog. The dog knows. The dog, the dogs always know. The dog could like see it. And the dog, the dog would like bark at the corner and stare at the corner. So it's just chaos at their house right now. At this point, it also starts to get a little bit more aggressive. 
and a little bit more violent. And what I mean by this is furniture is now being moved. Pictures are being flipped and turned. Things are starting to be thrown in the house. Um, this gets a little bit more serious later on. And so the wife has a nervous breakdown and I don't blame her. I don't blame her. And she goes to the hospital for a little while. A girl, girl, I'm so glad that you got a break. I'm so glad that you got to go to the hospital because God bless you, girl, because I probably would have had a nervous breakdown as well. I know I would have because I, I experienced these things and I would have been so pissed that my husband made us live in this freaking house after I already said it was creepy and now my life is being turned upside down. I can't talk to anybody about it because we look like lunatics if we talk to people about, about it. And it's not like my husband is, my husband has some like, he's like a pu public person now. You know, if you look up Bob Kramer, he had a pretty big political career too. So you got to be real careful about how the public perceives you when your husband is in politics and so lessa lisa however you say your name girl like my major respect like my hat is off to you and i'm so glad that you actually let yourself have that breakdown and get to the hospital because that is a lot to carry on your shoulders and like no one to help you with it so god bless you girl god bless you at this point the kids also seem to be having a hard time socially you know when you're a kid and you like want your friends to come over and spend the night well from what bobby jr accounts with with their friends with his siblings and his friends coming over to spend the night like they would come over one time and they would never come spend the night again so they're having a hard time. You know, you want your friends to come over. You want to go play with your friends. And and you're living, you're the weird kid that's living in the weird house. Like, your friends don't want to come over anymore. And we do see as Bobby Jr. gets older, he does say that over time, he basically started just going and staying at his friend's house. Like, would try to be out of his own house as much as possible. Would just go and stay at his friend's house for as long as he could. I don't blame him either. Especially the kids. They have no choice, right? They have no choice. So, they are kind of, like, doing everything they can to survive. Now, Bobby Jr., again, it's the, the physical assaults from this spirit are starting to get even worse with Bobby Jr. And I, again, I can relate. He's waking up with bruises, scratch marks bite marks so he is being physically assaulted by this entity same bobby jr same i absolutely know what you were going through i still get i mean my boyfriend thinks it's hysterical my boyfriend thinks i'm some like freak show he's seen me get assaulted by spirits many times he's watched scratch marks just appear on my back so bobby jr buddy like i feel you I, I know what that's like all right, you guys, so remember how I said the dog would, like, bark and, like, stare at things in the corner? I mean, listen, I, listen, We, I'm a dog owner. Most of you guys are dog owners. If a dog is staring in the corner, and probably cats, too, be a little concerned because I truly believe they can see things that we can't. So... Bob Sr., the father, got this idea, brilliant idea, that he was going to start taking pictures. So every time that the dog would stare at the corner, obviously was alerted, maybe hair was standing, bris bristled, standing on end, he would get, grab his camera and take a picture. Now, for my young ones who are watching right now, back in the 90s, we did not have iPhones. Most of us didn't even have the internet. And so when you took pictures, you actually had to use a real camera, not a camera on your phone. And you didn't get the pictures instantly. You had to take them to be developed. And so you, Bob Sr. did not know what was going to be on this camera roll until he got it back from the developers. And lo and behold, his picture showed this like misty skeletal figure that the dog was seeing so now they have actual photographic evidence of something in their house now around this time as well we talked about how bobby jr has become the target of this thing well his personality starts to change now yes you could blame it on teenage angst and that probably did have something to do with it 
But I could see how Bobby Jr.'s teenage angst probably got magnified by the persuasion of this entity. For example, he started to go through this, this goth phase where he was dressing in all black, painting his nail black, wearing eyeliner. I've said this before on my, my show. I don't know what episode, but I actually really like when guys wear eyeliner. <laughs> But I dated the lead singer of a band in L.A. for a really long time. So I kind of like that look. <laughs> but anyway, the guy later look. But he also, his attitude, he started to get um, kind of an aggressive attitude, which is, is typical for teenagers. But this got, this got worse than what a typical teenager would go through, which I totally do believe it was influenced by this entity that was targeting Bobby Jr. And this leads us up to the 2003 arrest. And I'm not actually clear because according to the report, it was Bob Sr. who punched Bob Jr. But in the podcast, I wasn't clear over who got punched. It could be in the podcast, their voices sound very similar, which is I mean, voices do sound similar within families, so that could be why it was a little bit confusing. So I'm going to go, I, I believe it was Bob Sr. who punched Bob Jr. as a teenager. He apparently came down the stairs. They were arguing over like a, a, a minor thing, like a bathroom dispute. And he just smacked him and he went flying across the, like a force that was not human especially someone who's not a boxer. I mean, he's a dad and a politician. Like, he's not in the boxing ring. And um, in the report, it said that Bob Jr. was kind of out of it. Like, it, it knocked him, like, really knocked him out. He was sent to the hospital that night. And apparently, Bob Sr. could not come back to the house for a really, really long time. Now, the charges would be dropped, would eventually be dropped. And I think both of them, from what I picked up on this podcast, are both being interviewed, do believe that this was the influence of the paranormal, that this was not something that Bob Sr. would have done on uh, in, in normal circumstances. And I, I can get that, you know, I think most parents, I know, I know there are bad parents out there, trust me, I totally get that. But I think most parents of teenagers do have arguments a lot with their teenagers and they don't ever punch them, right? So I, I actually kind of believe them when they say they kind of, from, from what it seems like this is a paranormal thing. And I, I absolutely agree with them. I think it absolutely is, is a paranormal thing. Around this time too, Bob Sr.'s mother died, so the kid's grandmother passed away. And he had an elderly aunt who was 88 years old, and so she moved into the house. So she was also living in the house. On top of that, the oldest child, the daughter, ended up getting pregnant. And so the baby daddy moved into the house as well. So we've got two new people now living in the house on top of the already four children and two parents and the dog. We're about to have a new baby living in the house, and the aggression with the spirit is is at an all-time high. Like, we're at the crescendo of violence that is happening in this home. Now, the next morning after the arrest of Bob Sr., when this incident happened, the great aunt, who was 88 years old, as, as Bob Sr. says, expired. Fancy way of saying passed away. The, the mom went in the bedroom in the morning and she, I guess she found her in her bed. Now was her death, her passing a side effect of the energy of the night before with this spirit? They seem to, from, from what it sounds like, they seem, seem to think so. You could say it was just her time. She was 88. Um, but the fact that it happened th the same night, presumably since they found her that morning, at this point, things are starting to get really dangerous. I mean, if they weren't already dangerous, now they're really getting dangerous. There was a time where um, back in the 90s, for the young ones watching, we had CDs, disc, and that's how we listened to music. And so you you had them in their cases. And, and a lot of kids, I mean, me, I, I think a lot of kids, myself included, kind of left their CDs out, like didn't necessarily put them back in the cases. And if you flung it, if you flung it, it was really, it could be really sharp, right? Now, there was an incident with Bob Jr. where he was in his room and a CD was flung across the room and like hit the wall. And it was going so fast that if it had hit him, it might have killed him. It might have cut him. And so at this point, Bob Sr. was like, okay, we've got to do something. Is this my house or is it the demon's house? Now, I would have just left. <laughs> I would have left. And Bob Jr.'s sister, the older sister who had had the baby, 
her now husband, the baby daddy, apparently walked in one night and saw the cloaked figure standing over the crib. And so they immediately like moved out. And it seems like Bob Sr. like helped them get an apartment. Like that's a baby. So um, I can understand that. So so there's people that are exiting the 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 shit show basically um but bob senior is is basically gonna go to war with this entity like this is my house you can't do this anymore so bob reaches out to the catholic diocese diocese is that the right way i'm not catholic guys of of pittsburgh and they basically call this a demon infestation that this is so bad that the, the stuff that's going on in this house is at an actual infestation. And Bob, I think he was still under this illusion, this delusion, as I spoke about earlier, where he, I guess he thought they would come in and just like bippity boppity boo, say a prayer and it would all be gone. But the, the Catholic diocese tells him that this is a serious issue and this is going to take a very long time. We're going to have to work a really long time. This is we're, we're in a war. And, um, it might not work. And I think Bob was very disheartened to hear it might not work. But this is the truth. This is what I was getting at earlier. This is the truth. Demons are not going to give up that easily. This is a war. And there is a possibility that we might just have to throw our hands up in the air and you might just have to move. And so nonetheless, they get started on the house. So they were coming in every week or so doing exorcisms, blessing the house, just continually coming. And every time they would do that, it would piss the spirit off. And that's another thing people need to know, too. I absolutely believe them when they say that when you do stuff like that, when you try to provoke it, when you try to get rid of it, it will get pissed off. It will fight back. It's not just going to go, ho-hum, you win, now I'm gone. No, it's going to throw a temper tantrum. So sometimes when you tell people, oh, just pray this or oh, just do that, you're actually going to make it worse for the person because that entity is going to fight back. This is why I'm telling you, if somebody is experiencing this, they need help from professionals. They need help from people who know what they're doing when it comes to the, the, the paranormal. My friend Cindy from Sacred Garden Yoga, yoga Sacred Garden Yoga fights demons. She knows how to do this, right? There are people who are trained, literally go through training to do this. And they know what to expect. They know that the entity is going to fight back and they know how to protect themselves. To just go willy-nilly thinking you can go, you can go vigilante on the demon's ass is not going to work. It's going to make the demon mad. Remember, angels are very powerful beings. We we know the miracles of angels. Well, guess what, my friends? Demons are angels. They're fallen angels. Their power is just as great. We are in mortal bodies. We don't have the abilities that they have. And, and being able to win a battle means that you have to know where your weak spots are. So please be careful when you're dealing with people with paranormal. Do not give them haphazard advice, especially if you've never experienced this. Okay? Just be, don't be arrogant enough. Do not be. The devil's greatest trick was convincing the world that he did not exist. Another great trick of the devil is making you think you can bibbity boppity boo it yourself. No. You need help. Okay? So they're in this battle. At this point, Bob starts to notice that he can actually smell it. He can't see it, but he can smell it. And I know that they smell terrible. It's a very sulfur based smell and his wife starts to smell it too. So Bob decides that he's going to hunt this sucker. So every time they smell it, they get that holy water and they start just attack, attack, attack. So he is now full on taking back his house. This is a full on war. This whole time, this demon has been traumatizing them, trying to dominate this house. Perhaps I don't, Bob thinks that the demon wanted them out of the house. I don't actually agree with that. Again, it's not my story, but from what I understand, what the demon wants is them to be terrified. He doesn't necessarily want them to leave the house. He just wants them to be terrified. And I think that's why in a lot of cases, with these, these paranormal stories, we see the, the story get worse and worse and worse over time. In the beginning, the demon's just trying to see what he can get away with, what he can do to get the, the humans in that low vibration of fear so he can feed, right? You don't want to get your, your food source out. You, you need a food source. 
you want to get them in a place so they can be a good food source, right? So that's my per perception. But now the tables are turned. Now Bob is actually hunting the demon and trying to scare the demon. Now, all as all this is going on, as they're basically in this head-to-head -head combat, we also know, again, Bob Jr. is waking up every morning or most mornings with marks on his body. You know, he's, again, getting the brunt of, of, of this. And I, I do kind of have my suspicions. We're going to talk about the room he was sleeping in in a minute, but I actually don't even think the room has anything to do with it. I think there's something about Bob Jr. Again, whether that's his blood type, whether that's um, his lineage, whether that's maybe he's a wanderer. I don't know. There could be so many things. Uh, I just think that the demon preferred feeding off of Bob Jr. for a specific reason. And I, I actually would be curious to know his blood type. I mean, I, he doesn't have to tell me, obviously, but I would be curious to know if he was O negative. There's nothing in the O negative blood. I'm O negative. And so I know that that is a favored blood source. Um, so anyway, but but that's just my speculation, okay? That's not anything that the Kramers have spoken about that I'm aware of. That is purely my speculation. At this point, the Catholic Church decides it's going to pull out the big guns. And by this, I mean a woman named Connie Valente. I think she now sits passed away, but Connie is a psychic medium that the Catholic Church uses when they need to get to the bottom of what's going on at a certain infestation. And what Connie picked up on about this house is eerie. So the Northwest Indian War lasted from 1785 to 1795. This was an armed conflict over the Northwest Territory between the settlers and the natives. And on this land, at this time of this battle between the Native Americans and the settlers, there was, at one point, a log cabin. In March, I believe, of, yes, March of 1792, a mother and her three young ch children were murdered by the Natives. They did this as a way to warn as a warning shot, basically. Like, don't come near us. This is what we'll do to you. The mother and her three children were then buried on the property. According to Connie, this grave of these, this mother and her children were in the front yard of the house now, that's standing now. At that, again, at that point, the house was not standing. It was a log cabin. So where they placed the bodies for burial turned out to be the front yard in current times with the house that's there now. Okay, now another interesting thing is in the 1920s and 1930s. As I said earlier, at the beginning of the 19th century, coming towards the, excuse me, the beginning of the 20th century in the 1900s, coming towards the end of the 20th century, the world looked very, very different. So at the turn of the century into the 20th century, the early 1900s, we still had a very obvious very obvious class system i think there still is somewhat of a class system it's just not as obvious anymore so it was very common to see a house that had servants quarters servants like upstairs downstairs downton abbey like this was happening all over the western world right as we start to move into the, the 20th century as we have world war one world war two leading into vietnam korea all these things you know, the, the, the summer of love, 1969, the hippie revolution, we're seeing a massive change in society. I think the 20th century out of all of history has the biggest timeline, the biggest shift in culture. And so we're looking at the 20s and 30s, we're coming up to the Great Depression, where we're seeing that type of upstairs, downstairs lifestyle kind of die and change. So the story goes, according to Connie, the family that lived there, that had servants that lived this hoity-toity aristocratic life, was running out of money. And in order for them to continue to fund their gentry lifestyle, they decided to sublet a room in their house to a pediatrician, a doctor. This doctor would then do this side business of Un I have to be careful about how I say this, guys, but unaliving babies that were 
in the mommy's tummies. And the family would just take the money to help pay for the workings of the house. Now, Connie kept saying this happened in the blue room. The blue room was Bobby Jr.'s room. So, now, they did, in fact, find, of course, there's no records of the unaliving of these these babies because it was off the record. It wasn't legal. But Connie described the doctor that he walked with a limp. He wore white gloves. He was an alcoholic. So many, so many descriptions that people in the town knew who she was talking about. They knew of this person, this doctor. Um, I think there was also probably speculation and rumors about his side gig too. So even though there was no um, actual records about this side hustle, we have enough hearsay, in my opinion, <laughs> circumstantial evidence to say, yeah, that probably was happening. We, we know this was common back then anyway. Now, when it comes to the mother and her children buried in the front yard, what Bob Sr. did is he hired this like radar to be able to scan the front yard to see if they could find burial plots. And they found them. They found four bodies that were buried in the front yard. And I actually wrote in my notes, I laughed because Bobby... <laughs> Bobby Jr., when he finds out that there are people buried in the front yard, his response is, of course there are bodies there. <laughs> I laughed so hard when he said that because I could just hear, like, the sarcasm and the, like, why wouldn't there be? Of course, after all these years of being traumatized by this paranormal activity, why wouldn't there be bodies buried in our front yard? Of course there are. So, you know, fair play to Bobby Jr. for having a sense of humor after all is said and done because I, like, almost spit my drink out. I was laughing so hard when he said that on the podcast. I was like, yeah, of course there are. Of course there are bodies there. So, now, with that being said, I, I don't think, from my understanding, that the um, spirits of the mother and her children or the babies that were unalive actually haunt the location. But it seems like what happened because of all of the stress and the trauma and the violence and the bloodshed that happened on that property, it attracted an infestation of dark energy, almost like a poltergeist experience. Like, you know, I keep calling it a demon and it might be a demon, but I, I think I, what I'm kind of seeing in my mind's eye is that it's more of a poltergeist. And a poltergeist is an energy that is created by the living. So we see this a lot with like teenage girls when they're going through hormones and they get, it's like this telekinesis um, experience where their energy and their emotions are so strong. The energy that leaves the body creates its own entity. And so I kind of feel like because of what was happening on those prop in that property, it created its own, its own like little demon. And that's just my opinion. I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on that because I know as we talked about a lot of the grimoires a few years ago, we're going to actually go back, circle back to some of those grimoires in a future episode. I'm working on a case right now, but we know that demons, when people do spell casting and they call on demons, there has to be an actual targeted location. It's not something easy that they can do. There has to be a targeted location and usually it's a person. So I feel like that, with that being said, this is definitely more poltergeist than anything. It was a created energy based off of all the trauma and the horror that was going on on that property over the years that collectively created this entity. Now, in 2005, a psychic from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, contacted um, the Kramer family. And she believed that this entity was living in a certain area of the house that she called the void. Now, some people could translate that as being almost like a portal. And I'm sure that there was like a portal-esque of energy there from the swirling of all the emotions that happened over the years at this house. But Bob took that to mean a literal place in the house. And thank God he did because he had an epiphany. Remember when I told you at the beginning about that hall closet where he would always go to pull the latch to turn the light on, but the, it was always like circled around and he could never quite get the latch. You know, I thought that was kind of weird. We had this epiphany that he needed to take down the wall at the back of the closet. I guess he realized, I guess you kind of know your house, right? You kind of can, in your mind's eye, see the layout of your house. And I guess he realized that there had to be a space kind of under the stairs 
that was sealed off from the rest of the house. So he took this wall down, you guys. And I think if I saw what he saw, knowing what he knew about his own house, I would probably shit my pants. As he explained over and over and over again, the way this house was laid out, no one could get into this area. Area Since the house was built in 1909, for almost 100 years, this place, this place, the house had been sealed off. There was, they, we're talking like, as I said earlier, a fine home, as my mama would say, a fine home. This was like serious woodwork. This space was never meant to be used. It was just a space and it was sealed off. But when they opened it, when they knocked the wall down, this space had not seen the light of day for oh, almost a hundred years. Let me tell you what he found inside this space. There were, there was a dead bird there. Um, amber, some amber, playing cards, crumpled paper, and some toys, specifically Legos. Legos are a modern toy, not a toy from the early 1900s when this house was built. These Legos, Bob Sr. recognized as from his child, Bob Jr.'s set that he had when he was a child. How did they get there? Whoa, I would have like run out of that house so fast, you guys. That is, when you are confronted with the reality of that, y'all, y'all, that's that's like a gut punch. That's like a holy crap. What have we been living with? Well, since this was the entity layer that Bob Sr. found, the entity got even more upset <laughs> and threw an even bigger temper tantrum. So Bob Sr. brought in more priests. They blessed the space in this layer and they just went balls to the wall, like constantly. Like it was their full time job, just blessing the space, blessing the space, blessing the safe, spraying, praying, 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 blessing the blue room, blessing the blue room, all that stuff. So they eventually got it to calm down to the point where they realized that this demon was only just still in the basement. Like it had whittled itself down just to the basement. So they went to the basement and they did one last round. They brought the dog in so the dog could kind of tell them where it was throwing holy water, doing one last round. It was a three-hour exorcism of the basement. And Bob said all of a sudden it just lifted and it smelled like roses. Now, again, ever since he wrote his book in 2014, there have been criticism and backlash. Of course there are. Talking about paranormal stuff is still controversial in a lot of ways. That's why so many people don't want to, don't want to talk about it because people think you're crazy. And a lot of the ex-owners say that nothing happened to them when they lived there. Now, again, as I said in the beginning, two things can be true. You can have people live in a house and have no experiences and then have someone else move in and there's tons of experiences. It comes down to the vibrational energy of the person, whatever that entity is attracted to, even for a poltergeist. But we also have evidence that maybe that's not necessarily true. We know that there was a box buried in the front yard from a previous owner where he would not answer any questions about that. We also have the story where the three-year-old Bobby Jr., when they were looking at the house to begin with in 1988, basically saw something. And the lady showing the house asked him if he saw something. You know, like if, if you didn't, if, if a three-year-old just starts screaming and you don't think the place is haunted, wouldn't you say, oh, honey, what happened? Did you hurt yourself? Do you have a boo-boo? What happened? Instead of saying, did you see something? So I, I think it's a mixed bag. And, you know, there, there could be people all in one family where some family members, again, are experiencing things and some family members are not. And the ones who don't experience paranormal phenomenon, I get this all the time. People who do not experience para paranormal phenomenon have a really hard time when they're confronted with it. You know, I, I just a side note, I've been rewatching some of the girls next door, which is the the old uh, reality show about Hugh Hefner's girlfriends from the early 2000s. And I, ever since that Secret of Playboys documentary came out and I've been rewatching it and I really um, I like uh, Bridget and Holly to the girls have a podcast now called Girls Next Level. 
And Bridget, uh, one of the girlfriends, she was, uh, she is really into paranormal stuff. I've actually reached out to her. I would love to get her on my show. I don't know who I got to talk to to get her on our show. She probably didn't even see my message, but I would love to talk to her. But anyway, she's really into the paranormal. And there was one, and I'm paraphrasing, guys. There was an episode where they were talking about how Holly was, like, interested in the paranormal, but never really had an experience until she had an experience. And then after she had an experience, she was like, oh, yeah, this, this stuff is real. Like, it takes having that one experience where you're like, oh, my God, this is real. Like, the paranormal is real. There is something beyond physical matter with our spirits. And so, I, anyway, I, I reference that because for people who've never had a paranormal experience, it's really hard for them to understand what that is like. Because when you do have phenomenon like that happen, it changes you. It absolutely changes you. It changes your percep perception of life. It changes the reality in which you live. So, so I, I, I can understand why that there would be controversy surrounding this house with past owners too. Now, Bob Kramer, it does look like he and his first wife got divorced maybe in like 2018. Um, and then he remarried. It looks like he's now separated from that wife too. Obviously all of his kids are grown now, but I want to take a look at this website because it appears that this house is now a bed and breakfast. Now, I wrote this down. There apparently has been no phenomenon at the house since the fiasco of, of their experience of, with the kids growing up. But now Bob Kramer, who's the proprietor of the bed and breakfast, he will not allow any ghost hunters to come in or paranormal researchers to go in. Now, for the critics out there that believe Bob Kramer did all of this as a scam just to, to bring attention to the house and to his book, that's a huge marketing scam, they would say, oh, it's because it's a marketing scam and he doesn't want people calling him out. But I think my first initial reaction when I heard that, that he won't allow ghost hunters or paranormal researchers there, is because he does not want to bring it back. He doesn't want to open the door for it to come back. And I get that because when you've had that type of trauma, you do have, you can get PTSD or CPTSD from paranormal activity. I truly believe that when you have gone through that, you will have PTSD from it. And so I absolutely understand. With that being said, because I am very susceptible to paranormal phenomenon, I, I don't think I would ever stay at this bed and breakfast myself just because I am a magnet for it. Now, ghost stuff, I don't care about ghost stuff. I don't, I can stay in a haunted house. It's no big deal. I'm not, I'm not afraid of ghosts. I've seen plenty. I'm not afraid of them. But when it comes to poltergeist or demonic activity, I don't want to be anywhere near it because I'm scared I would take it with me because I do, I do uh, attract it. So let's quickly look at the website, you guys. Um, just, I, I, just, I cannot wait to hear y'all's thoughts on this story. And I'll put this website down in the description box below for y'all to see. So and this is why I neglected to put up pictures. Usually I put a lot of pictures up because I wanted to show you guys this website. So. Welcome to Pittsburgh's premier hotel, close to the city, but not its congestion in a safe neighborhood. Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. The Brownsville Road House is well-known manor and landmark located in Pittsburgh South Hills. For over a hundred years now, it has stood as a grand majestic fixture along the historic Brownsville Road. It is hard to pass by and not be struck by the unique grandeur, tranquility, and idyllic setting. Here's Bob Kramer in Today. Today, that's him. Legend has it that the land upon which the manor is built once hosted a traveling George Washington in 1784 and was also the site of a terrible massacre of a family during the Northwest Indian War of 1792. An old red oak pays homage to where the befallen victims are buried on the property. Brownville Road, Brownville Road dates back to the 1700s and was once the main road to Pittsburgh from all points south. Explorers such as Meriwether Lewis, soldiers, presidents, and many runaway slaves all passed by where the manor now stands. The house is also known to many as the setting for the internationally renowned best-selling book, The Demon of Brownsville Road. Come and experience the now tranquil home and meet the author. So again, that's the book he wrote. So let's look at these rooms. So we actually do have the brown room. Let me go to galleries here so we can get a better, better view. 
Oh, here we go. All right. So let's pull these these photos up. So I remember I told you about the grands. There's the grand staircase. Definitely not a house I would. This is the brown room you got, or the blue room you guys. Like there's a cross. That's the blue room that apparently was the the room of a Bob Bobby Jr. where the um side hustle was going on in the 20s and 30s. Another room. I mean, there's the there's the, the blue room again. That's not a southern house. As I said in the beginning, that's a beautiful home, but that's not a southern, a southern majestic plantation house, guys. It's not if it was a maybe he thought that as a kid because of the columns, because we have a lot of columns, but it would like wrap all the way around the house and it would be two stories of columns if it were southern. All right, all these old obviously look at that the uh, now. Listen, listen, y'all. Well, maybe this is TMI, a little, little personal information about me. I will never live anywhere that doesn't have a bathtub. I love my baths. I love taking Epsom salt baths. I've been taking an Epsom salt bath every night before bed since I was in high school. So this looks like heaven to me, this bathtub. Just saying. That's a way to my heart is a good old bathtub. Some nautical stuff when they don't even live near near the ocean. Yeah, so here's some of the y'all. I mean, I can't wait to hear what you think of this of this house. I mean, it's very dark, isn't it? Like, I mean, I can appreciate a good historic home, but yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Does that cast a spell on you? That looks like a face in the window, doesn't it? Right there. I cannot wait to hear what you guys think of this. Would you stay here? Would you go and stay here now? If you could, if you live near, or do you live near? Do I have anybody? I'm sure I do. Have anybody watching who's from this area? See, here's all the, the nautical room, the Lincoln Suite, the blue room. We can get married there as well. I don't know if I would get married there, but, <laughs> but you know, yeah. So here's the bookings. I wonder how much it costs. Let's see if it'll pull it up. How much does it cost to stay there for a night? If it'll pull it up. Let's see here. Okay, so we're looking at the nautical room is 225 to 240, I guess for double occupancy, and that's probably for a night. Yeah, they're about the same prices for each room. Ooh. Is this the full house? You can book the full house, it looks like. For 645 to 685 a night, I guess. It's actually not that bad. It's not that bad, price wise. Yeah. So that's it, you guys. I am just dying. I'm literally dying to hear what you guys think about this. And I, again, I apologize for this being a little unprofessional. I never thought I would get on, on camera with no makeup on. I do have a little mascara on and a little lipstick on, but hair is not washed. Literally been digging through archives all day today. The sun has now set. I'm actually up way past my bedtime. Um, and I cannot, and I'm, like, I'm very, I'm sitting around suitcases. So again, I ap apologize for this being not super professional, but I just could not wait. I could not wait to get back to Atlanta to tell you guys this story or talk to you guys about this story to hear what you think about this story. I want to hear it. Do you think that this was a hoax? As many people believe. I don't think it was a hoax. Do you think that it was real? Do you think that it was used as a marketing scam? Would you stay there? Would you not stay there? Have you listened to any podcasts over this story? I just want to hear what you have, what you guys think about this. I, my opinion is it's not a hoax. It really happened. And I, I also think that Bob Kramer is a really shrewd businessman. And I think that you know, don't ever let a good opportunity go to waste. If you're going to go, and I don't blame him for that. Like, if you're going to go through that much trauma, why not write a book about it? And why not try to sell the story and open up a bed and breakfast? Like, that's getting the last laugh, right? That is literally getting the last laugh with this demonic entity. Do you think, oh, that's another question. Do you think it was a demonic entity? Or do you think it was a poltergeist like I do? Or do you think it was an earthbound spirit of, of one of the people that, that passed on the property? Let me know your thoughts. Be careful with your words in the comment section, guys, just because it's YouTube. Once again, I only delete co comments that are um, bullying. I totally want to hear different opinions and different perspectives. So just be very careful with words because not only does it potentially shadow ban the channel, 
but also YouTube can hold the comment or delete the comment themselves. So sometimes when you say specific words that we know YouTube doesn't like, they will delete the comment themselves. Okay, so just be very mindful of that. And yeah, I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful week. Once again, thank you so much for all the birthday wishes. I cannot wait to get back to Atlanta and continue. I've got a notebook full of stuff that I've been working on and can't wait to share those stories with you all. I'll talk to you all soon. Bye, everybody.